Okay, Rishan, I think we had some technical difficulties with the sound, but uh, you can uh, take over. Uh, okay. We can proceed. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the location that you are joining us today. My name is Rishan Fernando, and I'll be serving as the moderator today. I would like to welcome all of you to the second talk of the CAPSA Distinguished Speaker Series. If you're having trouble joining via Zoom, please note that you can either use the Facebook or the YouTube channel. I want to mention a few housekeeping items. Please uh, mute your microphone during the talk. We will have a Q&A session at the end, but you can type your question into the chat box or through the Facebook or the YouTube. Well, as an alumnus of University of Colombo, and as a student who had the privilege to sit in his class, I'm excited and honored to introduce our speaker today. Professor A.P. De Silva is no stranger to many of us. <clears throat> when you hear his name, the image comes to you is of a passionate and a caring lecturer with a big smile, wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt and slippers. That's how humble she is. Uh, Professor De Silva graduated from University of Colombo and went on to Queen's University where he completed his PhD and postdoctoral research in photochemistry. After serving several years in the Faculty of Science at University of Colombo, he went back to the Queen's University. Professor De Silva is a well-known and a highly accomplished researcher. He led the invention of the experimental field of molecular logic. In 1993, he published a paper in Nature it was titled a molecular photoionic and gate based on fluorescent signaling. The seminal publication revolutionized the field of molecular fluorescent PET sensors and switches and led to its explosive growth and numerous real world application, which he's going to talk to us today. Professor De Silva has received numerous awards and accolades over the years. I would like to share a few with you. In 2020, he received the Boyle Higgins Gold Medal and Lectureship. In 2018, he was awarded the Queen's University Staff Excellence Award for Lifetime Achievement. In 2014, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Proteomass Scientific Society. And his contribution to the scientific literature is equally impressive. He authored more than 70 papers, three books, and 15 book chapters. I also learned that he's also a musician and plays a percussion with an Irish band. And today his topic is from chemistry to medical diagnostics and information processing. Please join me in welcoming Professor A.P. De Silva. Is the screen on? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, then I can slowly start. Thank you very much, Rashan, for a heartfelt introduction. And uh, thank you also very much for the Kafsa committee, especially Rashan Arivansa for organizing it all in the background. So I'm very, very honored to do this talk for the Kafsa membership in various countries. But I especially want to also remember that uh, Kafsa represents the Faculty of Science in our old university, and therefore there will be people of various sciences and mathematics who will either watch this live or watch a recording later on. And I'm just a poor chemist, so I will try my hardest to be understood by everyone. I will try to make the time that you have committed worthwhile. So thanks again to everyone who is getting involved either now or later for giving me 40 minutes or so of your time. And I especially want to start by addressing the undergraduates at the Faculty of Science at the University of Colombo now, because I, I realize that you will feel that there is a crisis. And therefore, when we are dealing with basic problems of living, what's the point? of listening to somebody talk about some chemistry which is stuck in a university. I, I would appeal to you to allow me to present my case to you. And in the case, 
I want to present to you. I want to start with something that happened today, just three hours ago, these lines at the bottom of the screen. As you know, all of us are scientists of one form or another. We are not politicians. But at the same time, most of us are interested in current affairs because as scientists, we are interested in gathering knowledge. And so we want to know what happens in different parts of the world at the current moment. And so this is something that happened, as I said, three hours ago. The UK prime minister resigned as the party leader just three hours ago. So if we think Sri Lanka has crises, yes, UK has a crisis as well. So the prime minister said this, if things seem dark now, our future together is golden. Now, I'm sure especially addressing the undergraduates here now, you will say, ah, that is something which is so commonly said everywhere and by politicians especially, that it's bad now, but it will come better later. But I again appeal to you, we are all scientists. And when we are scientists, allow me to show the case that in our case, this can be true. I was fortunate to study at the Faculty of Science in the early 1970s, when there was also more than one crisis and many people died and the university was closed for some time. But still, we came through it and we continued our science education and we learned to prosper in different ways. And then again, I was fortunate in the early 1980s to be back at our Faculty of Science and to teach and learn there at the time. And that's the time of Dev Metresha. And then also we had crises. And God knows people died again. And still we came through it. And so if that was the case before that happened to me, then I would put it to you as the young undergraduates that even though times are dark now, the future surely can be golden. But that is not all. We are scientists, and in those in the early 1970s that I was there, and in the early 1980s was when I was there, I was fortunate, serious, you would say, the name of Sri Lanka, really, of happy accidents which would happen. And through those accidents, I was privileged to make some scientific discoveries. And what do we know about science? Science is when we establish a truth when we find out the conditions under which that truth will hold, that truth remains. It remains for all time and it remains for all people everywhere. That's the big difference with politics in science. When science, when we understand something to be true, that truth will help you to prosper as an individual. And as I will show you, it can help you to help other scientists to prosper by helping their thinking. And you can also, and I was privileged for this, I, you can also help other people, whether they are interested in science or not, it doesn't matter. You can help those other people to prosper. Now, as we have heard from the great religion, if you can be useful to other people, then your life is worthwhile. That is what I think as undergraduate now, you will be able to do. Because here is a old guy, bald guy here. And if I was fortunate enough, starting at the Faculty of Science at our university, to do a few things with the help of good friends, and I'll show you some of those things now, then you must feel for yourself as an undergraduate that even if times are hard now, you have the talent, you have the enthusiasm, and you have the creativity in science that should enable you to do similar or bigger things. And that is what will make your future golden. So with that, let me present my little talk to you. And as the title says, and as Rashan kindly pointed out, I want to take you from chemistry that I was privileged to do with these hands. With how we can go across from chemistry, across the spectrum of biological science, botany, and across even into medicine, 
which is in Kinsey Road, but we can get there. And I was privileged to get there. And I'll show you those examples. And similarly, from chemistry, you can get to information processing, which happens at computer science on Reed Avenue, you might say, and through pure mathematics. Which there. And chemistry can also get there. And I'll try and show you some examples. So let me take you on to my next little slide. I'm terribly proud of this. I show this many other places which have nothing to do with Sri Lanka at all. To show them, to show the chemistry department, University of Colombo, PO Box 1490, is to show them that even in the early 80s, that we could do bits of science which would contribute to the world, no less to the world. Huh? And so, Dio Singer helped me in this case, and Salia De Silva helped me in this case. And so, this is from a long time ago. This is from the mid 80s. As I mentioned, it's the early 80s. I was there with all the situation and in the early 80s. But we were finally able to print these two little papers, starting from Colombo, and to print them in something that is, in the, at least in chemistry, was a very valuable magazine or journal then. So once it's there, it's available in the world for all time from that. And this is where some of our ideas started. And I want to clearly state again, the inspiration for this was clearly from here. It was from the chemistry department at the time of the Faculty of Science at the University of Colombo. And now I explain bits of that science which able to happen to other people. The story is basically here. And this again is a slide which shows the places to show them that there is such a place called Colombo and a place called Belfast. And both these places represent capacity of small but great places. And in those places, at these times that I'm talking about, there were difficulties of various kinds. Northern Ireland had bigger crises than Sri Lanka at that time. And so, because of that, these are difficult situations. Facilities would have limitations in certain ways, but still, but still, worthwhile science can be done. And here is a little of that science. Uh, this bit on the side is just if you want to later Google up for evidence of things you these journals, but that's not important. The importances are in the pictures I'm trying to show you. So what we tried to do was to build a way by which humans can communicate with molecules. What are molecules? A quick reminder. We start from the laws of nature, the atoms, of course. Uh, in physics, we'll know that there are small building blocks. But for most of us, the building blocks are atoms, which even the great religions talk about. So philosophers have always realized the value of the small building block. And if you take the smallest building block, the atom, and you organize it, connect atoms together, you can build patterns of atoms. And those are molecules. And these molecules are the ones which drive life. So for the life scientists among us, these are the molecules that will underpin the botany or the zoology that you do or the medicine that we do. And of course, these subjects are important to us because we are living things. And therefore, when we are ill, we need quick repair. And then we've got to go to the medical people to help us. And they need tools and tools come from chemists who know molecules as well as any. And I want to show you one of those tools by which molecules can communicate with people like us. And to do that, we have to teach molecules to perform this really difficult function. How does a small molecule, nanometer size, communicate with a person like Rashan, who is nearly two meters? So how do we make that bridge? The bridge is done with light, and the light is fluorescent light. And the fluorescence light comes from things which are called fluorophores. The word doesn't matter. It's a dye, something which is very in color. In Sri Lanka, it could have been used for long times as cinema posters because they've got bright yellow, or it could be a shirt you wear which is bright yellow. You can jog on the street and a car won't hit you. And so, because of that, 
a fluorescent molecule component of the system that we are going to build, which will become a tool for the medical scientist. So we take a material that's in the box here, the structure, atoms, pattern doesn't matter at this moment. And then we take another box in green here, which is shown with a hole in it. Receptors mean what they say. These are molecules which receive other molecules or other atoms. And now, right now, when you are involved in this way, when you're thinking, every thought you think involves receptors receive other atoms or molecules. Along your nerves, sodium and potassium ions have to move, sodium as in salt. If the sodium has to move, it is caught and released, caught and released, and those are receptors. When you see with your eyes, God willing, then your eyes are doing similar. So receptors are And so then we take receptor and we take this fluorescent material and we connect it with this red box here. The red box is to make the fluorophore and receptor get into a, an arranged marriage, like out of the siluminous paper, the proposals column. You take a component and you get another component and get them to come close together. But like in a range, you don't let them get too close. So that's why it's called a space. It brings them close, but not too close. And this is an important function. When you do that with atoms and molecules, then the borophobeter have many of their properties. Like parents' genes pass on to the children to a large extent. But the when the reactor is connected together, some properties will change. Be one property to change. That is the fluorescence light that can come out of a fluorescent dye. We switch it off and we switch it by doing a trick that happens in all agriculture. All agriculture is very much for our botany. Photosynthesis starts with this process called PET, which is called photon-electron transfer. Photon is a piece of light coming in and takes a part, it's a fundamental particle, the electron within atoms and molecules, and it takes an electron from one place, pulls it out, takes it across, and pushes it into another place. That's the transfer. This is the heart of botany, this is the heart of agriculture, and therefore it's the heart of food and breathing that we get, because green plants provide like oxygen as well. So that is how we take a fluorescent material and make it non-fluorescent, we switch it off. And then when the electron is taken out of the receptor and into the fluorophore, it needs energy to do that. If you take an electron out, then in the oxidation, you will remember from high school. So to pay the price of some of the, the energy from the photon. And so you use this fluorophore to do the reduction. You have to pay a price again. Fernando taught me this before I came to university. So that is how we the energy of the light to do transfer of the electron. And that is why there is no light to come up. And that's why fluorescence is off. And now here's what happens. Take the same system we have made with these three blocks. When the receptor actually receives somebody, like I mentioned salt has sodium plus. Sodium plus is captured by this receptor and it falls into the hole. Now, the electron, why? Electrons are negative in charge, as we learned in high school. The charge on the sodium attracts the negative charge on the electron and kills the electron. Please don't go. So, for the electron. So, therefore, you no longer can afford oxidation. It's very expensive now. The reduction is nearly the same price as before. The reduction has undergone inflation very heavily. And so because now this electron transfer cannot happen, 
There is not enough energy to do it. The amount of money you earn is not enough to think you want. Which earlier used up its anger, now it does not happen at all. And so now light energy that becomes frustrated because it can't use it to do chains or back out. When the light usually loses a little energy by hanging around inside, so the color changes. But it might come out as orange. But now here's the thing. Orange light can be seen by all of us and it'll hit you in your face and you will know. Remember I mentioned very small, Rashan, but when this light comes out, this light will hit Rashan's eyes and he will know. That's the trick. So this is the way by which in Columbia, our faculty of science, able to be molecules have this power, magic even, to communicate with. Because the moment a small sodium atom moves into this small molecule, Big people like us, two meters tall, will know. This is it. Earlier there was a light signal. Now there is a light signal because the molecules light is so this off to on. So now let me show you what uh, what happened after that. If I can change the screen. Yeah, so here I bring you something from popular culture. This is from James Bond, Miss Banda, who was Gamini Fonseca in the old film, for example. Who is he's supposed to gather information? He's a spy, but he's a secret agent, meaning he's an agent for somebody else. So the Bond has a boss. The boss is never seen. See Mr. Bond here. Film, or here you see Bond in an old film. This James Bond was an Irish actor, so I wanted to show you it. And what, what is he told to do? He's boss said he's a bad man. He's a bad man. So you get to see him twice because he's so bad, he's going to die like this. But Mr. Bond's boss cannot access the, the bad man, lives in a very far away place. Usually it's on a lovely island. Like Sri Lanka, you would say. In the early James Bond films, it would be Jamaica, or in this newest film, it's a small island of Japan. So there's an accessing problem. Mr. Bond, who is an old man or an old lady, can't go there. But Mr. Bond can. So he goes and finds out information and eventually destroys it. That's the idea of the James Bond. Now think about us as scientists. We are scientists and we are five, six feet tall. Molecules are very tiny, and you molecules have to examine living things. Living things are our size or smaller. Say, for example, you want to find out inside a piece and I or Rashan, we can't get in there because we are too big. So we need an agent who is smaller, and the molecules we build with the three boxes are those small things. And they can go inside there and measure the sodium in it. That's what we are able to do. In the James Bond story, it said, now that's not, but the ideas are there. Except a complication in the James Bond. He is told to gather information about the bad guy. But then he finds somebody else on the left who is much better looking than the bad guy. So he gathers information there. Wrong target. In biology and chemistry, we have a word for this. It is bad selection. So we have to build our molecules to be better than Garmini Fonseca. We have to make our molecules more capable, not be distracted and go to the target only. And that's why molecules, when they are planned like this, they are miniature, small James Bonds. So we know the James Bond story. We don't even need the science. So this is how the James Bond molecules work. There is a little beaker, and in the beaker there is a little water. Over all these beakers shine ultraviolet light, which we can't buy on. So that is up here. And then, as you can see, it's black. There's nothing to see. But here, the beaker up here, also containing some of the dead molecules. So, 
can do off to one in different colors here for example and again here i can mention something which i first learned in pure mathematics classes at our faculty and when we learn set theory for example we learn logic operations this is a simple is called the yes logic operation and input is absent the light output is absent the back is present then the light signal is present input and output are always read and this is the yes logic operation and similarly with the same system i show now we not logical option or atom is present the light signal disappears and this idea is basic for the faculty of science in those papers i showed you with dr rupa singh and sali de silva were picked up all around the world and now there are over 1130 labs which have counted individual so there will be more which i will or as time goes on and doing that kind of research now he is the prize winner here and he is the nobel prize winner here so just to show again how an idea which can happen under difficult circumstances the middle of national crisis can become something of value in far away places even now much after 1980s so that's a lesson and again address my to the graduates among you they here i hope that you will be able to do similar things and exceed this in the future there are examples for you and it's a chance for me to show how the idea has spread to different parts of the world over the years or so method has been so now i want to show you a specific case again which i addressed to the undergraduates to say that not only can science help you to prosper usually like many of the kafsa members who do well in examples of that for instance and similarly when we do science we can help other scientists to think which i showed you in the previous world map which is only a sample world map as i said over 1100 people labs would participate so the numbers are much higher here is an example which i was very privileged to do with rosh the giant multinational and the scientists from there who helped me and here is also something i hope you will do later just button on your computer medical.com later if you have a little more time go to idex.com and then you can see how these ideas which started in the faculty of science so long ago are now used around the world today today and again an example of a molecule structure but don't worry if you are a botanist zoologist computer scientist mathematician physicist that's okay the green part is this is the green receptor i showed you here are some atoms here is a pattern which is circle and a sodium ion is a sphere sing to this space that's it that's the capture and it's a in pink or red and the floor of four in yellow and it's this is the basic idea which was developed at our faculty of science were able to take it as a multinational and make it do special things and i again address specially to the honor to say these things people a the same plastic chip which is like and as you can see this piece of plastic with my black spots were designed from ideas from our faculty of science so i'm very proud to show you this and it takes real whole blood from a vein and it goes from this liver to a part can and the blood can be and then in after 30 seconds it can be read in a small box like this and it has sodium level like a number but it can also measure potassium it can measure calcium and it can measure ph and ph can measure carbon dioxide it also measures oxygen but i i only did black spots here with the help of good friends and so and i wanted to show you made a substantial now as you see here it's 550 meters for this plastic chip like the box was not designed by us plastic chip was not designed by us 
the molecules inside here were designed by us. And that means something. So it's again something, especially for the younger undergraduates to say, you can use the ideas we learn through the Sri Lankan education system. And then we can learn in the library of ideas from around the world and put them all together. And when it's done, new creative science can be made. And I give you this as evidence that it is creative new science. Because here is science helping people everywhere. And I must also say, this was used during, during in Sri Lanka, during the early 2000s for suicide bomb victims, for example. So there's even a personal reason why you should maybe take a little moment to look at optimedical.com or idex.com so you can learn this and feel happy. And the pride and happiness we have that this came out of our faculty of science. I again, watch this. I mentioned Dharuna's name a little while ago, and I want Nimal Gunrapna, who's in Belfast with me, the closest to us. And so we made a case of and the laser and the green section, which is the receptor for something. You can catch protons, which is the smallest chemical species we normally have in chemistry, H, and it measures pH, which is widely in biology and medicine. And so these are now sold by this company here, Thermo Fisher, under this name. Again, you can Google for these. And so the, both of these came out of Sri Lankan. And this was actually Sri Lanka. And this is the green, this is the blue one. And these are used again in life-saving situations. This is from the Sloan Center in New York, one of the big cancer centers in the world. And where they do research, which then helps people in Maharashtra. So this is to understand radiation therapy, which is used in cancer. And here they were testing mice and they were finding out how to response to radiation. So this is before after, and not done just this is after. and they are using sensor blue, which is from Sri Lanka. And to show that radiation there is no blue areas or nothing much. And then after you get these blue areas. So it says acidic region developed during radio. And it's part of the understanding by us, but in tools from us. And again, Rashmi mentioned that uh, logic came out of Belfast, any molecular logic came out of Belfast. And Boolean algebra, which we, I learned in pure mathematics at the Department of Mathematics in our school. Of in, in our university, George Bull, who also was in Ireland, Ireland uh, 150 or 170. Or so, and Nima here is my good friend, Colin, he also works here. And uh, together, we were able to make the first discovery, the first case, the first way of experimentally showing that molecules can perform computing or mathematical functions. The first case. And so these are the books again that Rashan kindly mentioned. It's actually a book, but translated and Japanese. And I'm very grateful that the people in China and Japan realize this is a valuable topic for their young people to learn in their mother. So many things have happened since that time. It's nearly the 30-year anniversary. And I'll finish with one example of human level computing. So so this is for our biology friends, like. Of course, life is the highest expression of creativity. Many of us would agree. But this is to show that molecular lab can still do the same things. Why? Because life, as I mentioned earlier, is a molecular information technology. This is not big idea. We are trying to push that across people. If you mention in technology, naturally think of a company. But Biology is where information technology really because that is the application of knowledge at its best form. Why? A bus comes down the road. I'm walking down the road. If I don't see the bus, the bus hits me. I'm dead. Now, to be able to see and to be able to hear, that is the application of which I saw. And then I was able to avoid it. So put it to you as a topic to discuss and to debate. Information technology's best example is not in a phone. The best example is in anything which is alive, a plant or an animal or if you say a person. That is. So now let me finish by showing you this example. 
So, and to get to the example, let me remind you of a very basic fact. Don't worry, this slide has lots of stuff in it. You don't have to read. But the essential part I want to tell you is this. Here is what happens. There is a logic device, the little chip with lots of orange feet coming, the brass pins, electric signal, and some electrical signals. Out. And that is the basis of what IBM Access Instruments started all those years ago and now happens in all the IT sector. And which controls in different ways. Now, here's in the chemistry lab. Oh, you look at the chemistry lab. Here's take an atelier and then you put things into it, which is your substrate. Let's say you're cooking some food, say vegetable, and you put the vegetable inside. And then you have to, so you have to put the powders that you want to use, salt and pepper and things. And, uh, I'm not a cook, no, Nimali is an excellent. And so then you have to put those things in and then you have to apply conditions. Like you have to put heat for the right time and out comes something that mm, smells nice, tastes nice. And that's the readout. This is what we do in a chemistry lab too. We don't taste it too much. There are inputs which has to go into some substrate, and out comes a result. See, computer science and chemistry or human experience and action are the same. Action, reaction, that's what they see. Call response, for example. So these are very very broad ideas which we were lucky to seize on i think because of philosophical background we have in sri lanka so this is molecular logic grew as an experimental so again there are maps and now there are over uh, 1430 i think for the last count individually counted i have counted them so they're in the future and there are people outside of chemistry there are many molecular biologists who do dna work and entomologists and geneticists and even computer scientists it's wonderful now they have wet labs in computer science departments molecular logic here's my last example and i thank you for your patience and i will stop here is an example of something that you're doing now you're doing this now. we all do it when we are away if your eyes are open you don't even have to be listening. Your eyes are doing this. You have what is known as edge detection. Psychologists were the best people to understand this and explain, which is you always look at what's in front of you and judge whether it is a threat or not. If it's a big elephant coming at you, then you must run. And so therefore, threat perception is what it is. And your eye does it. And retina in the back of your eye does most of it. And what it does is it takes a photo of what's in front then draws only the outline because it's less information. In the modern world, we talk of big data, but your eyes are doing small data. They take the information in the photo, reduce it down into just the lines of the page and send it to the brain. Why? Small data is faster to process. And so it sends to the brain and asks, have you ever seen an edge of this shape? So it's an elephant, it will have beavers and a long nose, and it can spot it in milliseconds. Psychologists have done the measurements on that. In milliseconds, it will say, here is the edge, it's safe, it is not an elephant, it's just Resha. So it's not. So then I relax and I look at the person, we smile, we talk. So that is what was a which happens in all of us, and it happens with molecular systems. So there is molecular computing looking at something at all. And again, with friends like Joe, Joe, uh, Jessica, and Tom, to address this. And of course, as you know, edge detection is done in TikTok and Photoshop and everything else, in Zoom included, to your background, for instance. These are very common things. So here is how we, do it. we just take like square, we cut a hole in a piece of black plastic. Here is just a filter paper that many of us would have used in chemistry labs, in Hulu, which is soaked in our molecular logic materials. And then we cover the filter paper with this mask and shine ultraviolet light through it. And by controlling that, see, after shining light for 16 minutes, you, you most of the 32 minutes is best you now edge in orange and middle is all like blue again and the outside is all blue again and you just see the detected edge 
This is what your eye is doing all the time. Of course, your eye does it much faster. Within one millisecond, it takes half an hour. So, you improve it a lot. Years after that. So, thank you very much for your time. And, and I will say again to the undergraduates, science will look after you even if many other things and systems will not. And so, having said that, I'll thank you and hand it over to Reshan. Thank you, Professor A.P.D. Silla. Uh, let's uh, uh, thank Professor Silla again for a wonderful, interesting uh, talk today. Thank you very much. I think now uh, we will open the floor <clears throat> for Q&A. Uh, please yes. submit your question and uh, you can just type it in the chat window or through uh, Facebook or any uh, the uh, YouTube channel and then uh, we will get those questions. Um, so again, uh, it's a very interesting talk, uh, uh, Professor D. Silva. I have a question. Um, it, it looks like, as you mentioned, this is a very, um, uh, at, at the fundamental level, it's a very basic uh, uh, technology. Yeah. And so you don't need very sophisticated equipment like a mass spectrometers or things like that that are very expensive. Yeah. Uh, that we have in our lab in US and other developed yeah. countries. But for a country like Sri Lanka, this, if they can develop these diagnostic kits for, a, yes. for a, at least like for a healthcare kind of thing. Yes. And what comes to my mind is, you know, recently Sri Lanka was overwhelmed with this unknown kidney disease. Yes. There's a lot of people like a farmers, very young ages, yes. like their 30s yes. and 40s, they yes. have kidneys for malfunction, dysfunction. Yes. So could we have these kits kind of targeting to see what people are exposed to. Maybe there's a pesticide, so trace metals or heavy metals. Uh, Rishan, you're very, you're very correct. And as I just uh, must also mention, for example, some of our really close friends in China, for example, they have a national program, national program now to measure heavy metal mercury, which is exactly what you say, Rishan. And doing that over various bodies of water and soil all over China. And one of the techniques they are using for it is based exactly on this, on the fluorescent PET sensors. And so they, they try to measure the merc mercury levels in different places in this way. So you are very correct. I think it is possible to do, uh, of course. And as I and, and as I think you judged in your question also, the early work we did with Salia and with Daya there were done in, in the University of Colombo with the resources that were available in the university at the time. However, I must say that when we make a new molecular sensor to go for a target, of course, it is important to check that the molecule's pattern is exactly as we want it. So then it is important then sometimes to get the check from a mass spectrometer. So for example, at that time, even though we did not have a mass spectrometer, uh, I was able to send the samples to Queens Belfast here actually, and our friends here helped us with that. But I think that can be done even in the future because it's like it's easier, easy now to send a sample out and through the postal service kind of thing and get it over to a friend of ours somewhere far away and they can do the check. So yes, I think Rashan, you are correct. I think it can be followed in that way. And if I may make a little comment about the the, the chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology, as it used to be called. If I understand rightly, I think now they do know what the etiology is, if, if I understand. I think one of the understandings now is that it's the geology of the areas in which the, the people who are living there are exposed to it. And I think it seems to be a combination of high fluoride. I think that they seem to have established now, of course now, people should go know and see what the current literature is because as you know this is not only a problem in Sri Lanka it is a problem in the tropical belt there are several countries I think Honduras I think places like that if I remember places like that I think they have this issue and so in many of those cases I'm not sure what exactly they found but I think there is some in Sri Lanka it's the it's the rocks below and if it has a high level of fluoride which may be coming out with something like magnesium and I think they're trying to find that out so of course I should say more because I'm not um, certain of my facts after that but it seems like 
Again, now there was a case which was induced by politicians in different ways. But finally, science slowly moves along and finds out the answer. So you're quite right, Prashan. Like there is certainly the possibility that systems like this, which are low technology, and again, if I related to that last example I showed you about your our, our eyes, how eyes work, the test was done with a piece of filter paper. And uh, as you would know, again, some of the low cost tests, in fact, some of them came out of how that they were developing these low cost tests to be used in the developing world so that something like USA could go out and then contribute these kits to places where all you need is this piece of paper and a mobile phone camera. And then you send the picture you take out to a center where there would be someone who looks at the pictures, but that can even be done by machine vision and then look at the car changes. As you saw here, we are getting an off on signal. So it's machine readable. So you are correct. I think the possibility is certainly there to do this kind of thing. Thanks, A.P. Uh, for the answer and also the elaboration and explanation further on this technology. Uh, I have one more question uh, uh, coming from our uh, audiences. No. Um, I'll read it to you. Is it possible to design PET sensors in a way that fluorophore can get oxidized? For example, to sense ions like fluoride. Good question again. Uh, like you, the method I showed you, the pictures I showed you, I showed you cases where the fluorophore is reduced. Uh, and I must open in those cases, Rashan, and to, to our listener who asked that, uh, the reduction only lasts for uh, maybe picosecond, 10 to the minus 12th of a second, and then the electron goes back. So there is a lot of repair. So that, for example, the device does not die after the measurement is made. So that's why the Roche chip, it's not reused normally, but Roche did sell a version for a while. Then they found it's not profitable. Where you wash it and use it again, wash it and use it again. But the question is a very important one. The, the way I showed you was where the fluorophore used. But he, he, the questioner is very correct. You can also design them for the fluorophore oxidized to use the anion. So uh, very correct, I, I think. So for fluoride, uh, there are cases used for fluoride. And again, for the listener, I can say it's using boronic acid receptor. Boronic acid receptors will bind to fluoride. And then they have been used for making PET sensors also. But in those cases, if I remember, they were also cases where the fluorophores were used. But uh, fluorophores oxidized is now a known mechanism. So that's a very perceptive question. So there are examples of fluorophore being oxidized for picoseconds of time with the electron going in the reverse direction. Excellent question. Thanks, Professor APD Silla. Um, I have a comment, I think, from Vikram. Uh, 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 do you have a, a question or a comment uh, you would like to uh, ask from uh, Professor? Yeah, I just want to thank you, Professor AP. This is really entertaining uh, talk. Uh, you. Even though my area is uh, mathematics, uh, yeah. I learned something from your talk. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, um, I'm very grateful for the mathematics department because they love me too follow pure mathematics, even though that was not my subject combination. So I'm very grateful for all the people who were there. Like at that time, there were like Professor Samaranaika was there, Professor Gangadharan was there, uh, Dr. Tharmaratnam and Valentine Joseph were there. So I'm very grateful. In fact, Dr. Tharmaratnam taught us set theory. I'm very grateful for, for the Boolean logic. So, so we go with something I'm very grateful for. <laughs> Thank you. I have another, <clears throat> another question from our audience. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thinking about the applications of PET in cancer diagnosis, yes. do you think these techniques would be helpful in the diagnosis of both solid and liquid cancers? Yeah, yeah. It's a lovely question again. Lovely question. In fact, the answer is yes. Because uh, again, it was not done by me because I'm a poor chemist, but uh, this work was done. It started off in the University of Kyoto, a person called Hamachi, and then it was developed in the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. What, what they do is, uh, as the biology community, and I'm sure as our questioner knows, 
uh, at the early stages of cancer is where in different, now again, I, my knowledge base is very small, uh, is where uh, normal cell breakdown does not happen. So normal cell breakdown is where apoptosis takes place, where the cell is broken down carefully and systematically, and it becomes like the garbage collection. It takes away all the parts of the cell. It dismantles the entire cell, all the parts, to reuse the fundamental components, which is the ultimate in sustainability and recycling. So apoptosis is a very natural phenomenon, and we all do this all the time. And it's a privilege to hear uh, some leaders of the field talk about how the it's, it counts the days. It counts the days, the DNA telomeres, they are called, the end of the DNA unravels. And then the cell knows when it's too old and it says, now it's time for me to die. And then the cell has to tell the garbage collector how to die. It has to put a signal on the outside of its house and say, I am ready to die. Take me to Kanatta. And it has to do that. And it does it. And it does it by taking a fat which is living on the inner membrane of the cell. And it takes it to the outer membrane of the cell. It's, I, if my memory is right, it's called phosphatidylserine. This comes to the outside. And the moment it's on the outside, the advertisement says, I'm old, I want to die. It's like euthanasia. So all the cells do this. So earlier, they had a very complicated test, which I remember, take, if I remember right, take days to do. It's called the annexin 5 assay. Now there is a PET sensor test for it, which is immediate, which again uses ideas, the fact that the cell membrane, the phosphatidylserine, which comes outside is more negative. So then zinc two plus ions are used to bind onto that from the outside. And we basically have a PET sensor for zinc, which is what Prashan mentioned with heavy metals. So that procedure starting from Kyoto is available as an apoptosis sensor. So, of course, the question of can we diagnose the line of a tumor, for example. Now, I do realize it's a very powerful area of research. And in fact, I showed you a couple of Nobel Prize winners that first slide for cancers. One of them was Roger Chen, who used to work in San Diego, sadly passed away. Before. At the end of his life, he was collaborating with a surgeon to do exactly that, to try and get the place of the edge of the tumor. One of the ways they were approaching that is that solid tumors have lower pH than normal tissue because it's a solid tumor laid down too quickly. So it can't do normal respiration. Metabolism is different and the acidity is much higher. So you can measure. So Roger Chen was ideas like that and he died. But I'm aware, like for example, there is a lot of research on delineating tumor now by using modular sensors and a good fraction of them are using pet designs. So we can be very happy about it. Again, excellent question. Prashan, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> some of the early applications use substrates that will synthesize molecules. Yes. And then you, you also mentioned uh, some of these substrates are, could be naturally occurring biomolecules. What is the current status uh, uh, in this field? Are there more uh, interest in using synthetic molecules that optimize the, the uh, reaction? or use the naturally occurring biomolecules? Uh, oh, it's a very perceptive question, obviously from like a business-minded pharmaceutical person, which is excellent, excellent idea, because this is true. This is always the debate when you have an active molecule, a molecule which can serve in the body. Like, can you use natural materials provided they are not toxic. Of course, now you can take a natural material from a tree and it can be toxic to a person. But the question is well, the best way seems to be to, can you even make a molecule within the body itself? And it's really interesting because again, Roger Chen, this Nobel Prize winner I mentioned a moment ago, his career was two chapters. Actually, he came back to 
first chapter before he died, which is exactly in this question. He started out with synthetic molecules, which are made in a lab and which are then optimized from a lead like normal drugs are done. And then he went to a phase, uh, maybe about 20 years, he went to a phase he wanted to genetically create molecule from inside. And he did that for a while also. But then and he went back to synthetic molecules. And the reason we understood was because the genetic modifications can do something but if you want complete this, then it is easier to do it in a lab and put it in. Of course, the case I showed you with Roche, we are not putting it into the body itself. We are only putting it into a little sample of what the body provides. So, little bit of blood. So, for example, if the approval was very fast, because we were not putting it inside the body. So we could take a small blood sample, take it out and do the testing. And if we can take other fluids from the body similarly, then the possibility holds equally strongly. So I must say my own experience does not go very far along the genetic modification route, but the use of natural products certainly happens very well. For example, I can mention earlier, Sali De Silva from like he did a lovely example a while ago of taking an alkaloid. Like for those of us who are used to Ayurveda, when we take kasayas, for example, many of the active components of these kasayas are alkaloid. So they are alkali-like substances. These alkaloids, Salia was able to, he was one of the first people I know to do that, who took a known alkaloid, so it's a natural product, but now you can buy it from chemical supply houses, and then he modified it a little to make it into a molecular logic device. So the potential is in that line of research. So again, thank you for that question. Thank you for your uh, uh, answer and response. Uh, well, I, uh, uh, Professor Nalin De Silva, I think uh, you are on the audience here. You have a, a question, so yes. floor is yours. Yes, Resha yeah. Thank you very much sir, for the lovely talk. And as usual, you know, I I hardly miss your talks. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting to see your work. And uh, I think I asked this question earlier also, like uh, what we do here is now, uh, we modify the, the microorganisms like, you know, the bacteria and then yeah. um, even the zebra fish genetically yes. modified. Uh, so you can, we have developed sensors to detect like uh, zinc, uh, cadmium, uh, nice. and so on. And which uses the fluorescence ultimately uh, yeah. to detect. Uh, how do you, we, I think we can go up to parts per trillion level. How do you, how do you compare these two, the feasibility and, um, you know, the application wise, which is, uh, much more convenient there yeah, if you yeah, can. Yeah, we're discussing this. I think what you what you were explaining to all our audience is very valuable, like being able to genetically modify because colleagues on in the department, and also by getting the bacteria to grow it, the it's then there is no chemical synthesis involved, and so this is why I felt I must mention that Roger Chen early work, like that he was using green fluorescent protein. And of course, as you know, he got the note prize later for the various fluorescents that are available. And he could again put in bacteria and then in molecules like what you are saying. So, yeah, and then being able to go down to parts per trillion and so on can be very valuable for analytical chemistry. So I wish you very best of luck to continue that be very useful area of research. But if I can make a little comment, it would be that like, for example, the Roche chip, we are measuring to the minus one molar sodium. So it's very high sodium. So uh, because this is one of the factors, where analytical chemistry and uh, uh, semi sometimes having different goals. So in analytical chemistry, sometimes Sometimes the goal is to detect as lower as possible the amount of the substance we are looking for. And I think that fits with like the James Bond example where there's only one bad man and he's in a faraway place and it's really hard to find him. And so then you must have a high detection sensitivity. 
and fluorescence is of course very good to do that. But uh, in sensing, this was something I had to slowly get used to because the people in the sensing community were telling me, no, no, we don't want uh, analytical goals here. We want just to detect the level that is normally present. So, uh, and because we are monitoring a living system of salt, we're taking a little bit of blood and the blood is representing at the moment. If my blood taken now, so dilution, no, nothing. It, because all that we, so for example, when this was used in Sri Lanka, the paramedics would just take the blood from the patient and put it into the chip, this little chip, that's it. So there is no pre-treatment so then we have to measure the change about the normal level. So change about the normal level. So the normal level has to be done by analytical history. So they need to count as 0.1. So huge number compared to parts per trillion. And then we have to measure whether it's going from 0 0.1 to 0 0.11 or something like that. So small change about the normal. So uh, goal even though the molecule design can be very simple. And in this advantage of the system, which many people use now, is because it's predictable. So you can take a receptor of known ability to catch a target. So that receptor I showed you for the Roche is, uh, in an analytical sense, it is really rubbish. Because to catch it, you need so much salt, you can literally lick it and say, from the taste. But we now want to measure the difference around 0.1 molar. Because of that, sensing sometimes does not need a parts per trillion, but it's great to do parts per trillion. And the parts per trillion sensor, say the uh, device, will not be good for detecting a 0.1 molar because they need to saturate very soon. So the exactly. trick, I think, is the to keep doing the parts per trillion and to try and uh, regulate the system and to get the bacteria to give you a parts per trillion detector and then can it do a parts per billion detector of so it's nice to have a few more in the middle parts per million that's another couple of thousand we tried to do that again it was a paper from the university of Columbia shared with the uh, year Nali Gunasekar is on that paper from and that one and Suram Patuata Vitana trying to do in that to show this idea that you can make it's a bit like universal indicator in a chemistry you measure ph2 which is 10 to the minus 2 molar or you measure ph7 which is 10 to the minus 7 molar so a hundred thousand different so and the, all those can be combined together so we printed something in the american chemical society about that in 2007 or so. but uh, keep doing what you are doing now because it's real encouragement to us all that you are performing world class research from our faculty. So I think that is great and congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Nalin, for the question and then uh, Professor APD Silla for the answer and the expansion of uh, and more elaboration of the uh, response. Um, uh, I think you mentioned uh, one of your colleagues uh, during the early stages of work, uh, Salia Di Silva. Yeah, Salia, uh, you have a comment. Uh, he, he's oh, in the audience today. It'll be a pleasure to hear. <laughs> so, first of all, I just want to thank thank Dr. AP for the great talk and also mostly for being the greatest mentor. So, I worked with him like almost forty years ago in yes. 1985. <laughs> How do you still and, look like twenty? <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of fun. Uh, I remember we had, uh, you know, our instruments were not very sophisticated. We had to send our samples out to, to get analyzed, but the, fluor the I, I think you remember the fluorimeter, we had to manually move the gradings to yes. change the wavelengths. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I remember us getting locked up in the faculty building. Yes, night. exactly. And yeah, so, you had uh, enthusiasm at the time. You were willing to do the experiment as long as it took. <laughs> Anyway, so thank you very much for being the greatest mentor, sir. And this is a great example for, you know, young folks who are starting out. Thanks, Salia. Um, thank you, I'm going to wear my uh, cuffs hat now uh, and ask a, a kind of question. Uh, hopefully it's not forceful. Uh, our our uh, working with, you know, the chemistry department and then the faculty of science, I know uh, both uh, uh, Professor Upul Sonnadra and Professor Nalin De Silva, 
trying to expand the research side of the university. Uh, I mean, for a long time, I mean, we have been doing research, but you know, it's kind of more academic and the institution. Uh, so are there any possibilities for collaborations uh, that I'm sure they are more than you know, uh, 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 happy to participate. So are there any opportunities for considering that these techniques are, as I mentioned, or you mentioned that it's not highly costly, doesn't need sophisticated instruments. So that would be a perfect uh, opportunity for, for a country like Sri Lanka. I think, Rashan, that is a very valuable question. And I think because CAFSA has uh, powerful members in various countries now with these services available, I think it will be great for the future. Of course, now that possibility would have, would have also been available here, like I was in 1985 and six with Salia when we were working. Of course, now I'm an old guy now, I'm 70 years old, so I'm retiring now. And so because of that, I suppose I will have less opportunities of that kind. But the, I think the basic idea is very true. And if there were needs for that kind of collaboration, I think, of course, I think all of us will stand ready to help as much as we can uh, within the practical situations that we find ourselves in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Thank you. Um, I have one last question uh, before we end this session. Uh, it's uh, asking, uh, can you talk about a little bit about the differences of the PET and FRET, F-R-E-T, sensors? Ah, and really, how differently really. they are used in biosensing? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, FRET is a physics based technique but used with molecules and like it uh, like one of the guys who started that kind of idea like it, it's a person in germany called Förster. Uh, he was one of those people who uh, deserved a nobel prize according to many evaluations but uh, he was a member of the nazi party and so because of that of his connection with things like that Politically, it was never felt correct to give him a Nobel Prize. So uh, Theodore Foster was his name. And so he's the guy who developed this idea of fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer, which is what FRET stands for. And the question is perfectly correct. In biochemistry, this became very popular and still is very popular. And so the PET system, like from the beginning, we were very aware that both words would sound similar. And in fact, in some conferences, they would do PET comparisons, and which is what we are being asked for now. I think it's lovely to discuss. Oh, yeah. So now, I think in the biochemistry community, I think FRET would be much more popular. I think it would be used much more because it has this long history. Uh, Theodore Foster was from the 1950s. And then uh, many of you might remember, we used the biochemistry textbook by Stryer, Stry Stryer from Stanford. So that, because he was popularizing it as well, then the technique became very widely used among the biochemistry community. And of course, it has gone even further. But then PET, of course, as I said earlier, I'm a biochemist, so with not much of an understanding of biology or the biology attitude, which is needed in these things. So we would normally just do the chemistry and hope that biologists will take it on. And they certainly did. And Roger Chen was wonderful in this regard. As I said, he was doing it independently. But it was lovely to discuss with him in the earlier years. Uh, he, he, he was doing it maybe without the chemist, that chemist bit of background, but his chemistry was wonderful and oncologist by training and physiologist as well. So he was able to get ideas across into the biochemistry community through the pharmacological and the physiology people. So PET is used, still used more in the physiology part where you are doing things within the living system as it lives. And so I'm very grateful for that. So, like, for example, pet sensors continue to be used to visualize living systems. Like, again, Nalin mentioned zebra fish. And so, because they are transparent, you can see what's inside them by using this light signal. It tends to be used more in an environment which can be controlled. And, and I must, again, mention another weakness which Roger Chen overcame. It has the problem that it's an off on switch only. And so because it's off on switching, you have to control the other physical parameters. How uh, thick is the cell? 
how what are the dimensions of the cell and of course the cell is alive it's doing its own thing and then you cannot control those parameters and there are several other parameters which are hard to control and so because of that pepsis are used for uh, off on type of diagnostic situations do a roche is a case where you control it and use it for quantitative measure to save life literally so if you control the environment you can so in biochemistry in general you can control the environment you can put it into a nice glass cell for example but if you want to do physiology kind of situations then pet has this weakness so they use pet to demonstrate principle so for example there was a cover of science science magazine a cover of science and it came from harvard where they showed how the cell has its internal communications and that it was done with a pet sensor it showed calcium waves like a tsunami you can see the spiral waves develop or like a, a photo from a satellite of a typhoon or of a hurricane or tornado and you can see this and those were done with pet why because it's a very off on system you can very clearly see and that's how it ended up on the cover of science as one example so fret will continue to be used very in biochemistry because it uses colors so when you use two colors it has self referencing so you can correct for physical parameters for example if the cell decides to get fatter while you're watching it then the light signal will go up from both colors so you'll have blue and red and both blue and red go up and then if you ratio the blue intensity to the red intensity which can easily be done with a microscope just by changing a filter then the cell get fat has on the other hand with normal pet systems which are very simple but because they are simple if the cell gets fat the light signal goes up and then you think oh does that mean the sodium went up no no the cell just got fat so now there are self referencing pet systems also where we attach another color separately so the problem can be resolved but now the fret systems can do sim but one of the big differences between fret and pet if i can say for a couple of moments pet works at much shorter distances so we had the three boxes and the two boxes are very close together because the spacer is one or two atoms so because of that pet works across like 0.1 nanometer or even small whereas fret will work over 5 nanometers so it's great fret is used for example for dna which come into a loop so you open and close loop and you can change the distance from like 5 meters down to a smaller number or a larger number then you can use it for these purposes but there have been a people to use dna things and uh, also in general protein when the protein changes its geometry if the geometry changes two things within two three and then protein success be used also so some of the pluses and minuses of fret and pet system thanks very much for the question I think at this point, I will uh, conclude the Q&A session. Uh, now, I would like to invite Dr. Nalin De Silva, a senior professor of chemistry and head of the department of University of Colombo, to deliver the vote of thanks. Nalin. Thank you, Rajan. I will not take uh, much time now. I think I will listen to one of, I mean, a great lecture by Professor B. De Silva as usual. I mean, I mean to conclude uh, to give the vote of thanks. I will. take a couple of minutes um, you know to tell a little bit on prose apis which we have not um, probably uh, discussed at this moment and um, i think he is uh, he can't um, you know we know that he is the top 3 in the world for this discipline i mean uh, i i sincerely hope that if uh, uh, a nobel prize uh, for chemistry is to come to sri lanka one day his work should be uh, rewarded yeah he was nominated couple of times i think is it correct sir more or less but there are lots of nominations there are hundreds of nominations i know i know but there is there are reasons for you to get nominated uh, because we are very proud of you at least to get the nomination and hopefully we will see because 
three of you, uh, three teams, I mean, three people, I mean, um, our prize is normally shared between three or two and see whether we will see, uh, 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 we'll be optimistic on that. Or oh, that's, that's my comment on uh, how I see as a researcher where he stands, uh, even though, you know, we don't uh, value our, you know, the country is not ready to act get the maximum benefit of the uh, the talent uh, outside Sri Lanka. So he's one of them. And there is another one in audience, Professor Tilakaratna also there I can see. He is doing a lot of cancer research and so on. So, uh, um, and one more thing about the inspiration that we got. He always believes that the good science will not come from sophisticated labs. Harinesa. Yes, yes, I do believe that. It's so you have been telling us, yeah. So that is that is the inspiration we got when we joined the department, nineteen ninety eight. You know, we had less, less facilities. Now we never gave up because we always meet you every year. And you encourage us to, you know, do new things. So, so now we are, we are. I mean, some of you have uh, seen the the near the new look chemistry department. So we are going. Um, Ahead with developments and so on. So he's one of the, the inspirational characters that uh, made us uh, the people who are we now. I mean, that's really, thank you very much for uh, that inspiration, sir. And also to wind up, I mean, I, I, I have to officially thank you for accepting this invitation um, and uh, spending your valuable time um, educating, uh, um, many uh, listeners here and also even though we have uh, um, listened to you many times every time we learn something new from you that's the beauty of your talk yeah so thank you very much sir and uh, then next uh, I would like to thank uh, Kafsa, uh, Columbia University uh, Faculty of Science Alumni Association North America I mean, you're doing a wonderful job there. I mean, I have to appreciate that. I'm going to put a, a, a big proposal to you very soon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, organizing this kind of thing, uh, I mean, you know, bringing uh, the top scientists uh, uh, originated from Sri Lanka is a great idea. I mean, this is really invaluable. I mean, this, uh, you know, I have seen a lot of our new PhD students who just embarked from Sri Lanka who have joined. Um, so that, that can be, I mean, really it will like a domino effect, I would say. Yeah. So it's, it's like, that's what we expect in science. Yeah. Not like it's a standalone thing, you know, it goes as a, you know, and, uh, even though you retire soon, I mean, your legacy will be there and we will remember you forever. Yeah. So COPSA is, uh, great in organizing this thing and thank you very much. And thank you very much also for helping faculty of science and the chemistry department, and we appreciate your contribution. I mean, the schools in Sri Lanka are developed by the old boys associations. You know, that's why I strongly believe that uh, the chemistry department or the faculty of science, the alumni association have to be, you know, you know, we have to have um, strong contacts with them and to develop the to develop the department or the faculty of science and i i, I made this point too when the, when rashan visited when angelo visited recently when um, uh, i can't remember his name uh, jayakodi no i mean yes yeah chandra jayakodi chandra yeah and uh, and and i said the we, uh, we we need to develop uh, i you know um, the endowment uh, fund which we created. I mean, I will approach you and thank you very much for, this is not a time to talk on these things, but officially thank you for organizing these kind of things. And also the uh, for participants, uh, and the two different, three different time zones, UK, US, and Sri Lanka. And I, I, I got a power cut when the Q&A session, no, session was going on. I managed yeah. to get a little bit of fuel left for your talk for the ah, generator, sir. Thank so, you, <laughs> Appreciate so, it. Thank you. Thank you very much again for everything. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, Kapsa. Thank you for the audience. And thank you very much, all my teachers, all my students, and my friends. And excellent. Yeah. So thank, uh, you. thank you very much. On behalf of Kapsa, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, for participating in this wonderful talk. Thank you.
good night from this side yeah <laughs> thank you nali uh, appreciate it uh, and um, certainly uh, you will see the slide uh, uh, if you can read it if not uh, certainly uh, our kafsa distinguished speaker series uh, is 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 well and running and then if you have any uh, comments about topics subjects uh, or speakers please contact the uh, uh, kafsa subcommittee uh with the email and you can use our website uh, kapsa.org uh so the next uh talk that we are coming up in august is by dr jayani iti bandaralage she is going to talk about the plant biotechnology stem entry, uh, entrepreneurships so i hope that uh, you will join us for that talk uh, and we will continue to uh, uh have a collaboration with the university of colombo uh, and also our alumni uh where are they may be uh and i want to again emphasize the uh what professor apd sivla mentioned earlier we recognize the current situation is challenging in sri lanka to say the least but i hope you got some inspiration today uh as students we have a bright future and many of us have gone through some of those things uh and have come out of it uh successfully because you have a, a, a fundamentally you have a good education uh, that anchored uh, in university of colombo faculty of science uh, with that uh, professor apd silla do you have any last comments what you said you summarized people really, rashan i think what you said is the truth which is uh, kafsa members are example of how success come after undergraduate study at the faculty of science in the university of colombo so that's a great example for the people who are there currently even though the situation is a crisis now uh vikram uh, uh, our current president of the kafsa do you have any lasting comments before i conclude this uh nothing except uh, i really want to appreciate uh, you know taking time uh, professor uh, ap that was a great talk yes. professor nalin yes. thank you for your word of thanks and reshan you did a great job uh, moderating and i also want to thank our subcommittee hard working subcommittee uh, thank you guys thank you we'll conclude our session today So again, please join me uh, uh, thanking Professor APD Silva again for a wonderful and informative talk. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.